In this week's weekly funny story jokes, we bring you our best funny story joke compilation of the week. These story jokes are sure to make you laugh, from the first one to the last one. These are our story jokes which we love to generate. This week we bring you four story jokes, starting with a story about cannibals, until we finish with a hilarious story about a carpenter in a closet. Please watch to the end, as we keep the best one for last. So, sit back, get the popcorn, and get ready to laugh until your stomach aches. In our first funny story of the week, we bring you a hilarious story about cannibals and a father and his son that is sent to go and hunt for the tribe's next victim. In today's funny story, we bring you a hilarious tale of a tropical island where cannibals still roam. So, get ready for a roller coaster ride of laughs that will bring you to the punchline of the century. This island was well known for its tribe of cannibals and was very seldom visited by tourists, for obvious reasons. Now, even though this island had the occasional unsuspecting tourist making landfall, it would always turn out to be a one-way ticket, for the tourist, of course. The tourists, however, have been very scarce of late. As was their custom, they had an annual festival coming up where they revisited their cannibal heritage, and a subject for this feast had to be found to feed all the tribal chief's subjects. The tribal chief called a father and son to send them on a very important hunting expedition. I need you to go hunting in the forest for food for the tribe's annual festival. This is a very important mission, and I want you to get the best meat available. So, the father and son traveled deep into the forest, where they set up a hunting hide next to a small footpath, waiting for an unsuspected victim. A short while later, a skinny old man came walking down the footpath. The son, very enthusiastic, turns to the dad and said, Dad, let's get this one. I'm sure the whole tribe can all eat from this one. The father, not very impressed with what he sees, said to his son, My boy, that one will just not do. It has too little meat on it for the whole tribe. It's old and won't taste so nice, and the dogs won't even have enough bones as leftovers. So no, we are not going to eat that one. The old man was left alone to wonder on and a bit later a very chubby woman came walking down the footpath. The son, now much more eager than the first time, said to his dad, Dad, surely this one has enough meat to feed everyone. We can even have an after party with this one. It will also fry nicely if there are any leftovers. The father, again not very impressed with what he sees, said to his son, My boy, that one will also not do. For starters, it's very heavy to carry all the way back to the tribe. However, my main concern is that she might not have the healthiest meat. I would never forgive myself if some members of the tribe gets heart attacks from eating such fatty meat. I just think we should rather wait for something better. Now obviously, the son was getting irritated with his father's patience, but agrees to wait a bit longer. A short bit later, a beautiful healthy woman came walking down the footpath. Both the father and the son get a grin on their face. The son, now as eager as he have ever been, said to his dad. Dad, this one can have no problems. She's young, the meat must be very tasty, and we will be able to feed the whole tribe. There will even be enough leftovers for the dogs. The dad, grinning from ear to ear, said to his son. My boy, yes, we can take this one. However, we will not eat this one. The son, just very confused, asks his father. So, Dad, why will we take this one and then you say we cannot eat her? I just don't understand. The father, with an evil grin on his face, said to his son. My son, this one we will take home and then we will eat your mother. In our next funny story, we have an alien encounter of the funniest kind. This funny story is light years in the making, and the punchline is magic. All right, folks, in today's funny story, we bring you a tale of interstellar misunderstandings so epic, it'll have you snorting space dust. 
Our story begins light years away, on a planet called Zorb. We will bring you a crack team of alien negotiators, crash landing on a far-off planet called Earth, tasked with a mission of cosmic importance. Apparently, Earthlings have developed some doohickey that's throwing a galactic wrench into their whole way of life. Earth, the barbaric planet they'd only heard nightmarish rumors about, has apparently creating some sort of Wi-Fi wave that was giving their tentacle-based internet a serious case of the hiccups. These three Zorboids, exquisitely dressed in shimmering jumpsuits, think Disco Ball meets Astronaut, were on a mission. Now, these aliens aren't your average green blobs with ray guns. They come from a planet where societal hierarchy is everything. Their leader, the supreme leader Glork, is a being so feared and revered, planets tremble at his mere voice. Or at least, that's the official story. Negotiation was key. These Zorboids, Zork, Blork, and their intern, Flork, still learning the difference between a space probe and a space probe for your breakfast, were the elite diplomatic squad. After a near-death experience with a black hole that smelled suspiciously like burnt toast, they finally reached Earth. Landing wasn't exactly smooth. Their spaceship, resembling a giant chrome avocado, sputtered and coughed its way down, crash landing in the most unleader-like place imaginable, Farmer Jack's pasture. Now, Zorboids had studied Earth through blurry satellite images, but let's just say their intel was a tad lacking. Their high-tech life-form detector, basically a glorified Roomba with disco lights, beeped excitedly. The first life form it picked up? A particularly grumpy-looking cow chewing on cud. Zork, brandishing a space blaster that looked like a high-tech potato peeler, approached the bovine with all the authority of a space emperor. Earthling. He boomed in his voice translator, which kept getting stuck on a bad Elvis impersonation. Take us to your leader. The cow, unimpressed by this glittery interloper, simply blinked and continued its leisurely munching. Zork, Blork, and Flork, who was desperately trying not to giggle, exchanged bewildered glances. Surely their leader wouldn't be some bovine buffoon. Next up on the life form detector, a flock of sheep. The Zorboids, ever hopeful, repeated their demand. The sheep, in their own silent rebellion, simply shuffled a few feet away and resumed their grass-chomping duties. Our heroes were starting to sweat or, well, secrete a concerning amount of green goo under their jumpsuits. Finally, the detector picked up a life form with even less dignity. A scrawny chicken pecking at the dirt outside a rickety farmhouse. Zork, at his wit's end, bellowed. Enough of this avian charade. Lead us to your leader, Earth scum. The chicken, bless its tiny feathered heart, just kept pecking. Defeat hung heavy in the air, thicker than the stench of fermented space berries Zork had packed for the trip. Dejected, they stumbled towards the farmhouse, its peeling paint and crooked chimney a testament to its unique charm. The hinged door, which took them a good ten Earth minutes to figure out, whooshed open, revealing a scene that would make any intergalactic diplomat faint. A human, clad in stained overalls and sporting a suspicious amount of nose hair, was sprawled on a couch, glued to a glowing rectangle that emitted flickering images of men in brightly colored padded suits tackling each other. In his other hand, he clutched a container filled with a suspicious amber liquid. Now, Zorboids prided themselves on their adaptability, but this, this was uncharted territory. To get this leader's attention, they did the only logical thing. They stood directly in front of the glowing rectangle. The human, momentarily startled, looked around them with an expression that could only be described as mildly inconvenienced. Can I help you, fellas? He drawled in a voice that sounded like gravel being chewed. After a frantic exchange of clicks and whistles, their translator was officially on the fritz, Zork managed to sputter out, We, we demand to speak with your leader. The human, completely unfazed, shoved them aside with surprising strength and resumed watching his sporting event. Just then, a loud engine noise ripped through the air. The human shot up, 
a look of pure terror replacing his previous apathy. Oh no, he muttered. She's early. In a whirlwind of activity, the leader transformed his living room. Beer cans vanished, replaced by decorative pillows. He even managed to squeeze into a slightly stained shirt and apply a suspicious green goo under his armpits. Was this some barbaric earth custom? Just as the house was spick and span, a car screeched to a halt outside. The Zorboids, bewildered, have never experienced this type of fear anywhere in the galaxy. They watched as the humans sprinted towards the front door and shouted, Hi, honey, you are home early. As Mildred, Farmer Jack's wife, enters the house, the Zorbians, pushing all the buttons on their voice translator, bow down respectfully and said, Extreme Supreme Leader, we come in peace. In the following funny story, we have a son with some marriage problems, seeking some advice from his father. In today's funny story, we bring you Farmer Jack trying to assist his married son with some marriage problems. It's a hilarious and funny story with an even better punchline. So sit back and enjoy the ride of the marital process from the perspective of a car. So Farmer Jack was working on his car when his married son come to complain about his wife. The father said, Well, my boy, let me try and explain married life in comparison with this car. The boy acknowledged that this was going to be an interesting discussion. Now, the boy wants to know what car, or woman for that matter, his father preferred when he was still young. Well, the father starts to explain that when he was young, and he can vividly remember it, walking past the new car dealership, looking at the beautiful new cars, was like looking at the lovely ladies at a party. Everything was so nice, it smelled so nice, and you could imagine driving one of those cars for many years. You could not imagine ever getting tired of taking her for a drive. Some of those cars was every young man's dream. There obviously were very expensive and beautiful cars, and ladies, sports cars, and then basic family cars. And then there was the workhorses, the pickups. These things could go everywhere, any time of day, but they were just too expensive and no young man could afford them. And what car would you say, Dad? Was Mom like? The father looked around to see if the coast was clear and then whispered as he continued to explain to his son. When he was a young man and early in his career, he couldn't really pick and choose so much because you were just too happy with what you could afford. But a new car, he explained, was worth the investment. He could still clearly remember the day he made his decision on that small car. He could not sleep at night. He could only think about having that car as his own. Some men were obviously happy to drive used cars, but that was not the father's thing. He imagined driving long distances with his new car, traveling the country and so many more. He could learn about the engine, polish it on weekends and look well after it. But he had to wait until I had the finances to afford it because buying a car, or getting married for that matter, was very expensive. But he eventually managed to do it. So what you are telling me, Dad, is that Mom was like a new entry-level small car. It had all the features, you know. Affordable, reliable, fuel efficient, enough space at that time, long service intervals, and low on maintenance. And the styling was very cute for the era. Now tell me, Dad, how did things change through the years? The father continued by explaining that his son and his brother obviously destroyed the interior. He did not wash the car that much anymore. It didn't smell like a new car anymore, and the maintenance bills just kept creeping up. So the vehicle almost started to become unaffordable. It was making weird noises, had a lot of rattles, and the farmer battled a lot of times to get it started. This was a frustrating period for the farmer. I can imagine that it is about where you are now in your married life. The son shook his head in acknowledgement. So, the father continued, it's at that stage of the farmer's life he started to think he should have waited a bit and got something more durable, like a pickup. He started to think of getting rid of the vehicle, but 
He had too many good memories and she still did the job efficiently. At least she was still reliable. The bumper looked like it had a lot of hail damage. The body was a bit rusted, but it still did the day-to-day -day jobs very well. Now at that stage of my life, I started looking at my friends. They all were starting to get new cars, or wives for that matter, large pickups, sports cars, and much more. It all seems to look so nice. The farmer continued that he fortunately decided to wait it out and see how things unfolded. In the meantime, he started to take old Trustworthy for a total rebuild. The body was new and gleamy, the engine was overhauled, and everything was done as when it was new. And would you believe it, my boy? It drove almost as well as when it was new. All she ever needed was a bit of attention. The boy was now really interested and asked his dad how that turned out for him. Well, the father explained that once he decided to go down that road, he started seeing wonderful things about his old car again. Those guys that bought new vehicle every couple of years became very poor as they could not keep up with the image of this beautiful vehicle they were driving. The maintenance cost and finance cost of those vehicles were just so much more expensive than the car the farmer was used to drive. Many of them lost their vehicles when they could not afford to drive them anymore. Now the old farmer has got a grin on his face. My old car is now a classic. And because I've looked so well after it all the years, it has gone up significantly in value. I am spending so much time with it now. It's my pride and joy. He continues that the old car only gets to sleep in the garage now. It gets cleaned daily and polished every weekend. He takes the car to shows, and she has won many prizes. Even the young men would still like to have a look under the hood. But it's a no-touch vehicle today. In the meantime, the boy's mother came walking towards them with a cup of coffee for each of them. Now tell me, what are you two boys talking about? The son replied to his mother that they were talking about cars. The boy then asks, Hey mom, if dad was a car, what type of a car would you say he was? The old lady thought for a moment and then said, I think that if your father was a car, your father would have been a garbage truck. Obviously much larger than what he is supposed to be. Always smelly, but hey, we can't go without it for more than a week. In our last funny story of the day, we bring you a tale of a carpenter and a ghostly sound. As promised, we left the best for last. But before we go, we would like to thank you for watching our funny story compilation of the week. If you have enjoyed it, then please subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon. This way we ensure you get notified about any releases from us. Thank you so much. So here goes with the last joke of the day. In today's funny story, we bring you a story about a haunted closet and a very cornered carpenter. Imagine a very particular housewife, Agatha Huckleberry, being very annoyed with a creaky closet every time a bus goes by. She decided to call in the help of a carpenter to fix this ghostly problem. Agatha Huckleberry clutched a pearl necklace in one hand and a phone in the other. The rhythmic creaking coming from the closet was enough to drive anyone batty. It wasn't a constant groan, mind you. No, this was a symphony of shudders and squeaks that only erupted when a double-decker bus rumbled past their house. Agatha, a woman who prided herself on a well-maintained home and a perfectly curated accent, some might say, couldn't take it anymore. Hello, Bernard's Carpentry. Yes, this is Agatha Huckleberry. I seem to be having a rather peculiar situation. Every time a dreadful double-decker bus rattles past the house, my closet door sounds like it's auditioning for a haunted house tour. Oh no, dears, it's quite sturdy. Mahogany, you see. But the noise, it simply won't do. Could you possibly send someone over? Bernard's Carpentry, known for their motto, We Fix Anything, even if it's possessed by a polka-dotted ghost, a marketing ploy that surprisingly worked, dispatched their finest, Harold, a man with a perpetually worried expression and a toolbox that seemed to hold the solutions to life's most bizarre problems. Mrs. Huckleberry, 
Harold here from Bernard's Carpentry. Ah, Harold. Do come in. The dreadful noise originates from the linen closet right there. Harold peered into the closet. It was a typical linen closet. Shelves crammed with neatly folded towels and Agatha's extensive collection of doilies, some crocheted by hand, some suspiciously store-bought. He tapped the walls, prodded the shelves, even sniffed the doilies, a habit he was trying to break. Nothing. Hmm, seems sturdy enough. Can't say I see anything out of the ordinary, ma'am. But surely you heard the racket just then? Here, wait for the next double-decker. They come every ten minutes, like clockwork, the dreadful things. As if on cue, the rumble of a bus engine filled the air. Agatha and Harold stood expectantly. Suddenly, a loud creak reverberated from the closet, followed by a clatter of falling doilies. Harold jumped a foot in the air. See? Did you hear that? Harold gaped at the closet door. This was one for the, we fix anything, even if it's possessed by a polka-dotted ghost hall of fame. Well, this is a puzzler. Perhaps if I... Goodness, no, you can't possibly climb in there. Ma'am, I've dealt with rogue rocking chairs, possessed rocking horses. Those things are terrifying. Even a haunted grandfather clock that insisted on playing disco at 3 a.m. in the morning. A noisy closet door won't phase me. Now, if you'll excuse me. Harold crawls into the closet, Agatha looking on with a mixture of disapproval and morbid curiosity. Inside the closet, Harold contorted himself into a pretzel, dodging doilies and trying to get a good look at the creaky culprit. Minutes ticked by. Agatha fidgeted and then went into the bathroom. At exactly that time, Agatha's husband Bartholomew arrived home from work earlier than usual. He called out to Agatha as he enters the house. Agatha, my dear, I'm home. Bartholomew, not getting any response from Agatha, walked upstairs wanting to get a warm jacket, as is his usual routine, from the ghostly closet. In the meantime, Agatha, knowing about the carpenter in the closet, rushed half-dressed out of the bathroom to warn Bartholomew about the imminent danger of a carpenter in the closet. But before she can reach him to explain, he opens the closet door and got a surprise of his life to find a strange man hiding in his closet. At this exact moment, Agatha, half-dressed, enters the bedroom with a very surprised look on her face. As Agatha desperately started to explain, Bartholomew interrupts her abruptly, turning to the man in the closet. He then asks, And what exactly are you doing in my closet? The carpenter, understanding the awkwardness of this scene, of a man in the closet, a half-naked wife, and a very surprised husband. He clearly understands the predicament and he decided to go for the million dollar answer. You will never believe me, sir, but I am waiting for the bus. <laughs> if you liked our joke, then please watch our next joke by clicking here.